Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review, and I'm here today to talk to you about how animation always seems to do comic book lore better than live adaption. You know, it's been said time and time again, you know, there's been a lot of live action TV shows and movies based off comic books that just aren't to par. There's just something missing. There's a spark missing. Sometimes it could be a bad script. Sometimes it could be a bad director. It could be bad acting. The costumes don't look great. Um, CGI don't look great. The choreography don't look great. The story itself just isn't all that compelling. You know, it's just something weird and uncanny. Cause you know, when it comes to movies, for the most part, you never know if you're gonna get a sequel. So for the most part, you have to cram years and years and years worth of information into anywhere between like a two hour, um, hour and a half, three hour movie, sometimes four <laughs> and stuff. And you know, it's a lot to cram in because you gotta cherry pick which parts of the comics you wanna adapt which storylines you want to adapt, which characters you want to bring in. And sometimes they're just not always done justice and stuff, you know? And it's quite a shame because animation, it has a lengthier time. You know, you get season after season. If it's popular, a couple of episodes in, you can tell longer stories, the longer story arcs. Um, it's just a whole lot better to do. Now, one obvious reason why animation just does it better than live action, let's get this one out first, is you can do a whole lot more. It's so difficult, whether right? you're using practical or CGI special effects, it's difficult. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of muscle. It takes a lot of dedication and a lot of focus and stuff. And sometimes you still can't get those shots that you just want to get. And you know, and it's quite a shame. And there's a lot of people who work really hard on this stuff. And sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's decent. Sometimes it's passable. Sometimes it's garbage and stuff. And so animation just allows you to do things better. A person can fly better. A person can teleport better. They can use their super, um, super strength. They can like, you know, shoot laser out their eyes better. You know, cause most part, you know, animation people, they can just like, you know, animate that stuff like in a, a long period of time and get it smooth and make it look great and stuff. Action, sometimes they have a little bit problem with that when it comes to animation. They're getting a little bit more better now with hand-to-hand -hand choreography and stuff. And so, you know, so I praise them for like taking their time and dedication. Cause you know, even back in the old days, you gotta remember how animation was, man. You had to like draw everything by hand, frame by frame, cell by cell. And it was such a tedious thing. Now it's all done with computers and stuff. And, but in the recent years, they've been going that cheap route, like say Marvel, they go that cheap flash animation route. Their characters look flat. The backgrounds look flat. There's no rendering. There's hardly anything going on on screen. It's everything is just flat and everything. And you know, and it's quite a shame. But like animation from back in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, man, that was like the peak of animation and stuff. And you know, I love it. Now, another thing, the reason why animation can sometimes do it better is costumes. Let's face it. A lot of times these costumes just don't look great on live action. And it's because the material they use is hard for the, uh, the people inside the costume to move around and stuff, you know? It's very difficult. And so, say you have a Batman suit made of rubber, it looks great, right? But they can't move in those things. So they have to make it to a point where they can move and then it starts to look cheap. When you start seeing fabric overlapping with that of rubber or fabric overlapping with that of whatever that like material is used to make like, um, like motocross gear and stuff, you know? And then you have somebody like say over in the CW, which they're very leather heavy and stuff. They love their leather. The Flash wearing a leather suit makes no sense because he's supposed to zip around real fast. So he's supposed to have light, right, uh, lightweight material and stuff. But they always put him in leather until now they got him in spandex. 
and the process has really improved i remember titans is a good example robin's first costume the dick grayson one it does not look great when it's fully lit <laughs> it doesn't even look that great when it's in the darkness it's big it's clumpy um it just looks like fabric with um rubber pieces attached to it it looks terrible now the jason todd robin costume looks a million times better it's still fabric with the rubber stuff on it but it still looks better and of course the nightwing suit is perfection in everything until you look at the back basically what it is is just like a um spandex outfit where the front of the outfit is all rubber stuff and the back is all fabric so that's why you never really see him shot from back that much and you know they're getting better but not really now if they were to use that process with a cape then of course you won't be able to see the fabric in the back and stuff and you know I'm trying to think of some other costumes and then you know sometimes in live action they don't even go the superhero costume route in this um wb days they just wear regular clothes and that was just always weird and bizarre like birds of prey they wore outfits their outfits had a unique design trench coat um leather outfits um black outfit pants you know some type of decoration but they were still clothes nevertheless they were street clothes and then you got like smallville and everything where all they wore a bunch of hoodies and clark just wore like a shirt and you know and stuff like that and of course, they did bring in Green Lantern and uh, Green, um, Green Arrow in and some other people. And the Green Arrow one did look good. The other ones, not so much because they were just weird hoodies and stuff and still fabric clothes. And so they did that one reason because they just didn't have the budget. They had to have their budget for CGI. And so, yeah, that just totally sucked. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, God, man, that's terrible. And, you know, like, um, now this is a little bit diverse, um, di um, di dicey and everything. The whole Adam West Batman outfit. I like it for the most part. And you know, I grew up with that, you know, when the show was in reruns and stuff. And I like that outfit. But, you know, compared to a bat suit today, that's not going to fly with people. You know what I'm saying? And because it, what it was, it was spandex and it was like some type of silk fabric material and everything. And so while it looks, you know, passable and everything, you want something more believable. You want him to wear more tactical looking gear because, you know, he has to wear that. You know what I'm saying? And so now let's get into the big major reason why animation is always done better than live action. They're more faithful to the comics. See, here's the interesting thing when it comes to people who do animation. You got two different people who's going to work on animation. You're going to work on somebody who grew up being a comic book nerd and read as many comic books as they could, collect as many comic books as they can. And so they know the knowledge, they have the love, they have the passion for it. So they're going to produce the best thing they can because they want to emulate what they grew up with and they want other people to as well and that is what's known as the holy grail of like comic book adaption then you have the other people in animation you have the ones who don't know nothing about the comics or the characters but they make sure they do extensive research to get those characters right because if they don't get those characters right people are gonna talk and once you start talking then it's gonna start like a group of people and then it's gonna start a movement and then people gonna get pushed out and then they're gonna bring other people in and other stuff like that some of the best examples i can think of where people are like true comic book fans is bruce Tim. The man created literally the holy grail of what is Batman. You know what I'm saying? His cartoon was a true adaption, but he threw in as many elements from the comics, from the movies as he can to make his thing. I've already told you the story. He said a long time ago, he was just working on Tiny Toons and they came with him after Tim Burton's Batman. They're like, hey, you want to make a Batman cartoon? 
He literally said he tossed everything aside on his desk that was t Tiny Toons related and just started drawing Batman. And we have the greatest Batman anything of all time, which is Batman the Animated Series. Now, he has stumbled in like, you know, recent years. He even stumbled back then when he created the new adventures of Batman. He redesigned everybody with no explanation and stuff. And the stories were more action filled and less drama filled, story provoking and stuff. And that with Pokemon just met a demise and stuff. But the man has been creating great content for decades, 30 years, I believe. And, you know, even in his um, animation movies, he, he made some of the best ones back in DC animation and stuff, you know. And but sadly, like I said, he stumbled. <laughs> when he created his own version of like the justice league trinity <laughs> and then he stumbled even worse with harley quinn and batman and a few others and stuff and it's just kind of like come on bruce tim get your bruce tim back now now he is gonna make a hbo match which is not no more <laughs> i mean he still might make the cartoon but the platform is no more he him and matt reeves are gonna make a prequel to batman the animated series he says it's going to be more Batman animated series than Batman animated series. And that has me worried because he's been stumbling lately. And he's on HBO Max where he can have curse words and um, nudity and stuff like that. And I don't want to see that. You know what I'm saying? Just make it as good as that before. However, there's a still picture. And I'm thinking to myself, that can't be how Batman looks. Because we know how Batman looks in year one. We got like a silhouette in there thing and it does not look like that. So... Only time will tell, and only time will tell if David Zaslav will allow him to make it and stuff. And, you know, and not only Bruce Tim, but, like, his entire team that worked with him. Like, they were very passionate about comic books as well. Dwayne McDuffie, um... Ah, I forgot his name. I want to say James something. Oh, no, I forgot his name. I know there's Glenn Mirakami, um, Paul Dini... James Tucker, that's it. And you know, those guys are huge in the comic books and they created their own like series and video games and animated movies. And they were as faithful as could be with also adding their own stuff and their own flair to it. And then that's true dedication. And this is why animation is always better. They get these characters. They have, they grew up with these characters. They, they probably even think these characters are like their best friends because they know them so well, you know? And then let's get to something a little bit different. Take Spider-Man the animated series or take X-Men the animated series. I'm not 100% quite sure about these people backgrounds, but these shows were the holy grail of Spider-Man and X-Men. They are literally the best of the best. And I believe when it comes to X-Men, I think i'm not 100 percent sure but i think the creators of that didn't know anything about the comments but they did their research and i believe and i'm not 100 percent sure but i believe john shempa was the same way with um spider-man and my god look at it they made sure the animation looked like that of the comic they made sure they brought in characters from the comics with the and they tweaked their personalities to make them better because sometimes in the comics you had the one-dimensional villain like say dr octopus who just wants to steal money and create stuff and destroy stuff but they made him into like a sympathetic uh, sympathetic character to where he was a brilliant scientist where people have misused him and everything. They used him and took the credit for his stuff. So he wanted revenge. That's so much better than the comics. Or say Norman Osborn, who was just a criminal who became the Green Goblin. But in here, it showed that, you know, he got exposed to gas and he turned crazy. And so he has a split personality. And that was used for the live action movie and stuff. And not to mention Venom. Venom was, you know, a bunch of astronauts going into space. They found like a they found like space rock, brought it back to planet Earth, and it spawned into that of uh, Venom um, attaching itself to Spider-Man. In the comics, it's completely different. They were doing like the Secret War thing, and Spider-Man costume got damaged, and Hulk's like, "Hey, there's an alien machine here that will literally make like anything you want." So he created his um new outfit but then the symbiote took a hold of the outfit and it just came out black and he's like oh i like this and i'm gonna wear it 
and stuff, you know? And that's how all that came to be in the comics. So it's where they knew a lot about the comics, but they adapted it in a way that made more sense in their thing. And they was passionate about those characters when it comes to that of X-Men. They killed Morph in the first episode because they said they needed people to realize the true hate that the humans have for the mutants and they needed that death but of course in cartoons you ain't allowed to let nobody die so they had to bring him back resurrect him in the second season through um mr sinister's weird technology and stuff but he literally died and everything and you know and then when you look at a lot of newer um combat properties just in animation wise they're not as good no more and these are some people that are very passionate and you know because like um greg cowell i believe i believe his name is now he did some good stuff in animated movies but um and he did good with um x-men evolution but x-men evolution is far apart from what the x-men were it was basically just a teen drama with mutants in it and one reason for that is because studio interference this is why a lot of superhero cartoon stuff now just ain't as great as it used to be because the studio is getting involved. The studio got involved when they told Bruce Timm, hey, make a teenage version of Batman. He couldn't do it with his Bruce Wayne because Bruce Wayne didn't become Batman until his like mid-20s. So he created Batman Beyond and that was a great cartoon. But the studio still was not happy with it. So they went the more younger route with the Batman and stuff. And with studio interference, like, you know, Avengers, Earth Mightiest Heroes, which was comic book faithful, got canceled because studio interference and stuff. And they brought out Avengers Assemble. And it's because they want something that relates to the movies and they want toy sales and stuff. Young Justice, when it was on Cartoon Network, was their own thing, but it was cool and everything. And they took from like Elseworlds comics and stuff until the toy sales sucked. And then so they canceled it. And then about a decade later, they brought it on HBO Max and stuff. And I don't like it now. <laughs> and then now you don't get me mentioning the newer Marvel cartoons that are out, which are just terrible. But, you know, and there's still passionate people working behind it, but they're not allowed to do what they want to do. And then when it comes to live action... It baffles me how bad some of these character portrayals are and their new powers and this and that. Take the X-Men franchise from Fox. Brian Singer literally told his cast, do not read none of the comics. Do not watch none of the cartoons. He wanted them to come in fresh and bring their own thing to it. He made two good X-Men movies, but the first X-Men movie, even though it's good, it's just a lot of explaining from Professor X. And it's kind of like, well, we already know this stuff. We know who Magneto is and we know who Sabretooth is. And we know, but see, Brian Singer don't know that. And he's thinking everybody else don't know it either. And so like, that's one of the most dangerous things ever is when you bring in an unknown and the unknowns all like, don't read the comics, like screw the comics. And because a lot of the portrayals like Rogue, she ne like Anna Paquin is a great actress but she is no rogue and that is a reason why because she knew nothing about the source material he made her into a whiny teenager who cries a lot that is not rogue rogue is a tough sudden girl storm is supposed to be an african like queen like weather witch type person and she's supposed to have the accent and then in the movies she don't have the accent and everything she did in deleted scenes but then they made her get rid of it and stuff and she's about as american as american could be a lot of them got americanized um colossus in, in the original x-men movies he's about as an american as american can be um banshee and stuff and there are just so many other characters mystique had no relation to rogue in the X-Men franchise. And people just kind of like, well, well, what's going on here? And same thing with Nightcrawler. People were so confused by the second X-Men movie because it looked like Nightcrawler wanted to like hump his mom and everything. And they tried to have a little inkling, of, okay, maybe these two have like a scene together. Maybe they're related, maybe they're not, but nobody knew nothing. And then when the, the younger X-Men movies came out, the prequel ones, 
things got more confusing because we see Mystique and we see um, Nightcrawler's dad and we don't see them together together but she later joins them and we never see her pregnant or nothing like that and it's just kind of like weird and then when he took over the franchise again he had Mystique interacting once again with Nightcrawler but once again we got no relations to if they related and the same thing with Quicksilver and Magneto we still don't know if those two are even related in like you know the movies and stuff and it's just baffling how he screwed all that up and not to mention some of their powers are different like take jubilee there's a deleted scene in the second x-men movie where her powers are starting to activate but it's not sparkly fireworks it's electricity that's not her powers and you know now he did now, it's, it's disgusting as brian singer is because that man has been alleged to mess around with young boys and stuff um as disgusting as he is he made some improvements to the x-men lore but the rest of it was just like baffling and it's just like why but we had to take it now they're black suits I do like the black suits because there are some comics with the black suits and stuff like that but they're so one-dimensional they have no personality to them and stuff now i'm not expecting the colorful yellow and blues and stuff like that um but something a little bit more comic book faithful will be like appreciated and stuff you know and so it's kind of just like you know and when he made his movies they revolved around plots that really had nothing so much to do with like the comics and stuff and and like striker striker is so different in the comics he's a religious nuts who on um, stuff like that and in this one he's like some military dude and it's just like and then there are some people who are related and who aren't saber tooth and wolverine why in the world are they brothers and stuff I don't get that why is havoc the older brother to cyclops that makes no sense and don't even get me started on the whole dark phoenix thing and then of course they brought in brian i think that the first one brian singing the other one was brett ratner and brett had no idea what he was doing if you, I mean, he's a disgusting man as well with a me too story and stuff like if you listen to his commentary on the third x-men movie he's getting characters mixed up like he's all like oh that's such and such from the comics and i'm looking i'm like that's not such and such from the comics and then i think somebody had to like correct him and then when you saw the people who work at marvel comics talk about um brett you can tell they was not pleased but they had to make up some goobly got about like you know how he understood this and how he understood that but he didn't understand nothing and you know you can't even keep track of who the characters are because they keep recasting and stuff the whole angel thing was just dumb the whole cure thing was just like wasn't done properly and the whole ugh, apocalypse thing my god what was that about and i don't even like the uh, the younger x-men movies because i think they butchered the whole days of future past thing uh, yeah it was interesting but i was expecting more stuff from the future and more sentinels and like this and that like it was at least in like the comics or at least in like the animated series and then when it comes to like the Batman movies, why does he always kill in his movies for? Either he kills somebody straight up or he just lets them die. Now, yeah, I get it. In the earlier Batman comics, he carried a gun and he killed people. That's before they established who he is and his no kill rule. His no kill rule got retconned in the comics and stuff. But when you watch a movie, all you see him doing is murdering people, especially in the DCEU. That man just like blowing people left and right. <laughs> and, stuff. and, you know, it's just like strange and odd. Then you have like Barry Allen. Doesn't matter which version you have. It doesn't matter if it's like the CW one or the DCEU one. They keep giving him Wally West personality and that makes absolutely no sense. He's more straightforward and everything. 
probably the best depiction of him was probably in the 90s series and i've never seen that but i heard it's more um mature and stuff same thing with green lantern and that uh they made him so comedic and stuff i don't understand that and it's because people don't know what the world they doing then you had that jonah hex movie where he all of a sudden has supernatural powers to bring like the dead back to life and he couldn't do that don't even get me started on the ghost rider movies it's just these are they bring in people who have no idea what they're doing and they don't care because they just want a paycheck and they don't even look at the source material. I mean, Taika Waititi, he admitted he only read one Thor comic book and that was a very thin one. And he just came in and did his own thing, but had to add in some Thor elements and stuff. This is why in Thor Ragnarok, some of his major villains don't get that much screen time. I forget the dude with the giant head. Um, but you ever notice when they have giant monsters and like these Marvel movies, Thor movies, they don't really get their proper due like they do in the comics. And that's because Taika Waititi don't know what the world he's doing. And then take Hela. Hela is a major villain in the comics. And they wrote her to be Thor and Loki's sister where she's actually Loki's daughter. She controls the underworld and she hates Thor and Odin and stuff and they just made her into a ventral oh daddy locked me up type of girl and now i'm just killing people left and right and it's just she had hella had no depth to her no she was just a one-dimensional villain and that's because taika didn't know what the world he was doing because he just wanted to throw laughs and giggles and stuff in there and not even get me started on love and thunder he butchered that entire thing he literally said he made a movie knowing people would hate it and he did that on purpose and stuff and he just wanted to make his own man child type movie and stuff you know and i don't get that like i just really don't get that and then you have all the fantastic four movies which are the first two i like i don't love but i like i like the first one better than the second and for the most part they do try to be faithful to it but then they start tweaking things and turning things around and it just doesn't seem right and those movies should have been bigger than what they were but they kind of fell kind of flat a little bit and then that third one we don't talk about that <laughs> but when the second one i'm thinking to myself okay look you have the Silver Surfer, you have Galactus. Why couldn't this be huge? Huge! Because they didn't have the budget for it and stuff. The Silver Surfer, they could have done so much more with that. And Galactus, while yes, he is a cloud in the Ultimate Combos, and that's what they went for. Cause, um, So I can appreciate that, at least they stuck with the comics on that. But we didn't want to see that version. We wanted to see the world devourer as a giant man you know and then you have people who take on these big projects just because they're trying to make like say somebody happy like take m night Shyamalan. the only reason why he made a live action avatar the last airbender is because his daughter like katara and everything so he came in and he butchered that entire uh, movie he didn't know nothing about the characters he tried to add his own spin to things he tried to make things more realistic and stuff with the pronunciation pronunciation of the names which threw people off the way they used their bending was completely off it was more like a dance than it was bending and he had no idea what he was doing because he took on the project with like loving intentions but he had no idea what he was doing same thing with Joel Schumacher, may he rest in peace. He took that on because his nephew, I believe, liked Bane and stuff. And it was kind of like he came in and it's a little bit more complicated because it's a result of, because like even Tim Burton didn't really get Batman that well, even though he made two good Batman movies, but he made his too dark. Studio came in with Bob Kane and McDonald's and they changed it. They wanted more lighter. So he made it more lighter, but he changed so much stuff that things just didn't feel right. And then Batman and Robin was just a disaster and stuff. Characters and villains had completely different backstories and mindsets. And it was just like baffling stuff with all the neon colors because he was trying to do the whole Adam West thing. But how would that gonna work in a live action, darker setting, you know?
Then we get to like the Marvel Disney Plus shows, which for the most part are not faithful whatsoever. They're just tongue in cheek for Disney baby humor and everything. Like they like I'm still appalled by Moon Knight. I was expecting to see violence. I was expecting to see some action. I was expecting to see like a little blood and everything. He's got season two now. So hopefully they will improve on that. But I did not want to see some man and his mental illness for the duration of six episodes and they focus on a character that's just a split personality type person uh i mean I could, it's okay they didn't go because like there's two different versions of moon knight in the comic they have one with split personalities and there's one where he come up with these alternate people to help him navigate around his detective type stuff i'm glad they went the sp split personality route but i didn't want them to focus on steven they should have focused on mark and you know, and it's just terrible how they were not faithful to that the comics and still don't know what this has to do with the overall MCU plot line. Ms. Marvel, as you know, I am not a fan of. They changed her power for some bizarre reason. The show wasn't even about a superhero girl. It was just about this teeny bopper living in the real world who happens to gain superpower. See, one of my major gripes with the Miss Marvel live action show is it doesn't even really focus on her. The main focus is on the bangle and her new powers that overshadow the entire series. Her new magic powers overshadow that of the character because us, the viewers along with the characters were trying to find out how her powers work. That literally was the emphasis of the entire series and we still don't even know how or why they were because they didn't have a cohesive plan and everything. And it's a shame because the powers literally overshadowed the character and stuff. Every episode we was wondering, well, how this work and how that work? And we getting a little bit more information only to have more questions and everything. And that was the downfall for my opinion of that series. Not to mention, if you watch Marvel Rising, Kamala Khan in that cartoon series is a whole lot better. She already has her powers. She already made her own outfit. She is training to be a superhero. She um, fights along other heroes, get captured, and persuade other heroes to take up the fight, and she becomes a leader in herself. This never happens in the live action one, because the live action one is too much being a Disney Channel like teeny bopper and everything and running from her villains and constantly just shooting up like defensive um, force field type things. That is not Miss Marvel in, in any kind of way. And then they threw in that twist of where she traded places with Captain Marvel. So once again, her powers um, are taking over the entire series because we're trying to figure out how and why. Like they imply that Kamala's mom knew about the bangle and the powers, she didn't. They imply that her grandmother knew about the bangle and the powers. She didn't. And then it's like Miss Marvel is just a TV bopper Disney Channel type show in the beginning. Then it turns into a family show. Then it turns into some kind of like something on the History Channel. And then it goes back to being a teeny bopper again with a semi superhero in there. But it's just like her powers overshadow the entire show of the mystery of what the world is going on with her powers. Then there's American Chavez. Now, when I saw her in the uh, Multiverse of Madness movie, I thought she was just okay. Like there was nothing special about her, nothing like that. And she was just there. And then so when I watched Marvel Rising and I saw that depiction of American Chavez, I'm just like, holy crap. She's an actual character. She has personality. She has flair. She has an angry side to it. She can fly. She is super strong. We didn't see none of that crap in like the movie version. In the movie version, she's just a scared girl who's running through the multiverse and stuff. And that's literally it. She's a damsel in distress. And the one like watch Marvel Rising. She is a million times better. And also in animation, they get the people color tones better and stuff. Like both Miss Marvel and American Chavez are supposed to be dark skinned girls. American Chavez is supposed to be more of a darker 
um Latino. We don't know exactly what kind of Latino she is because she comes from like another world and stuff. But she's Latino with dark skin, and in the movies they whitewashed her. As for Miss Marvel, she's supposed to be a darker Pakistani Pakistani girl, and in here she's like light skin and everything. And you know, there are actual dark skin Pakistani actresses in Hollywood, but they didn't go there and. You know, I don't like having to rag on the actress who plays Miss Marvel, but then in live action, you, it's weird. You'll have somebody who's passionate, say like Nicolas Cage. He loves Ghost Rider, right? And so he comes in and he does two Ghost Rider movies, but they just don't work out. And then same thing with Ben Affleck, who came in and did Daredevil. He's a huge Daredevil fan, but he his portrayal of it wasn't that great. I think sometimes if you're like a super uber fan of a comic character or something, and you go to play that character, you go in like a kid, and you just kind of give like a bad performance, you know? Because it's the kid in you coming alive. I just think animation just think, does things a million times better than live action. And it's just, it's quite a shame. It's too bad that live action can't get their act together because it could be so much better. Like any superhero show on the CW is not comic books accurate. Like they throw in little elements here and there, but like say the Arrowverse, the Arrowverse is just its own thing. Supergirl and that did not act like Supergirl from the comics. She tried to act like Clark Kent. Um, Green Arrow tried to act like Batman. Um, Ryan Wilder's Batwoman tried to act like Terry McGinnis, and it's just not working, you know? Alrighty, well, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.